Hello and welcome to episode 20 of this series as I build my way through the Battle Games Middle Earth magazines. This has been such an epic adventure so far and this month proves to be quite a challenge as well I reckon. As I stand here I'm just uploading last month's which was a really good fun build in Mariah and the next month which is now is building Barlin's tomb. Now I mentioned at the end of the last video that I had made an attempt at doing this and failed it. I wasn't very happy at all and I've kind of just pretended I didn't do it mainly. I filmed a load of stuff, it went into the vlog and it never became a build me video because frankly I don't think anyone would want to build what I did. So this is going to be a bit of a challenge because there's a little bit of a uh, psychological block uh, having failed once but also it's going to be great because I'm absolutely sure that following these instructions will give a good result as they normally do and uh, yeah I'm, I'm stoked to get stuck into it. I'm going to take apart the other build that I did, the other board, and it's just pointless having it, it's going to take up space, and with what I'm going to do this month I won't need to. So I'm going to cannibalise that a bit, I have some parts in there which I may be able to use I think, uh, and um, I'm not sure again this month what my special build is going to be, uh, it may end up being that the Balin's Tomb is, is enough frankly, and I think it probably will be with what, everything else that's going on and how busy I am. So. I'm looking forward to it, I hope you are. Let's see what happens this month and let's point the camera down and have a look and see what the magazine says. So here we are, uh, modelling workshop for Barlin's Tomb. This is magazine number 21. In this PAX modelling workshop, we show you how to create Barlin's Tomb as a terrain piece. This will allow you to reenact one of the most exciting scenes from the Fellowship of the Ring film when the heroes are attacked by the denizens of Mariah. Within the final resting place of the Dwarf Lord Balin, the Fellowship faces a dangerous challenge. Trapped in the claustrophobic chamber, the heroes are forced to fight their way past a horde of goblins. This modelling workshop teaches you the techniques needed to make your own version of the tomb a fantastic set piece that allows you to recreate this tense, exciting battle again and again. And as an aside, it is my favourite scenario in the entirety of Middle Earth Strategy Battle Game, so I'm pretty excited. Although this scenery piece is constructed specifically for use with the Barlin's Tomb scenario, with a little imagination it could easily be used to represent any large chamber in Mariah, Mordor, Isengard or even Osgiliath. And there's a hint, maybe we'll try to do it a little bit modular, um, not fix things in place quite so much, and then it will become more reusable. So, you'll need cork floor tiles. Now, I'm not sure I'm going to use those. I bought some wool tiles and they are a bit kind of rubbish and they flex, so I might use something different. Pen and pencil, foam card, craft knife and steel rule, junior hacksaw, pink styrene sheet, Decorative wooden beading, not sure where I'm going to get that from. PVA glue and super glue, balsa wood sheets, polystyrene cut it, ceiling tiles, hot wire cutter, scissors, gravel, small stones, and modelling sand. Two toothpick holders, huh. clippers, textured paint, a selection of acrylic paints, and several paint brushes. So, there's a, quite a list of requirements there, but most of them you'll have if you've been building along with me, or you can probably find more easily than I can, stuck as I am in the uh, wilds of Bulgaria. But we'll get there. So the first part is the chamber, uh, and it talks about planning the tomb. So I'll read this out, and then I'm going to get myself planned, and then I'll bring you back for that. So, we decided to make our tomb in separate sections, in a similar way to the lake in Pack 19. Ha! <laughs> this modular technique, yeah, my, my lake is still going, I'm still pouring resin. Did 1.6 kilograms yesterday of resin. This modular technique not only allows you to break up the amount of work you do, but also makes the whole piece easier to store. Now that's really a good idea, isn't it? Firstly, we decided on a size for the tomb. We wanted it to be 60 centimeters by 60 centimeters, or two foot by two foot, with a corridor leading off one edge. Therefore, we chose to make each section 30 centimeters or 12 inches square. You will find it very useful to draw a paper plan featuring all the components you intend to make. So, that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to get myself a pad and I'm going to start drawing. I'm going to work it out. I'm not sure what size I'm going to do. I think that sounds like quite a good size, 60 centimeters square. Uh, it might be that I decide to do it as one um, piece uh, and then so one and a half pieces with some of the um, basic materials that I've got. But I'll bring you along for that decision and we'll get going on there. So yeah, let's get started making Barlin's Tomb. I've gone away and I've done a little bit of thinking about materials. 
And I have decided against using the cork. I had a look at them and they are too warped for me to use. So what I'm going to be using instead is this stuff here, which is actually PVC board. Um, I have a couple of sheets of it here. Um, I may end up using more than one, but you can see that it's a stuff that's kind of got the corrugation between um, and it's very rigid, it does not warp, and I've had a lot of joy with it in the past. It's lightweight, it's a really, really, really good basing material. So I'm gonna do uh, the Barlin's Tomb on this, and because of this, I'm not gonna do it in five different sections because I'll be able to fit the whole of it on there because this is actually a little bit bigger than they ask for. It is 60 centimeters across, um, we're just under, so that will be the four squares. So what I may end up doing is cutting down another one to slot on next to it to do the corridor. Uh, but first of all, I'm going to work on the walls on the first stage, and then as I say, I might cut that down. So the base and the walls, let's, let's read that. So for the base of the tomb, we use square cork, I'm not doing that. Uh, most towers have a smooth side and rough side, which is especially useful for modeling projects like this, where the rough surface can represent the stone floor, which is a really good idea, and I may end up using the cork, just not as my basing material. You will need five towels for this modeling workshop. Arrange the towels in the shape of the tomb. You might want to refer to your plan and sketch it onto the towels themselves to act as a guideline. The walls will surround the outer edges of the tomb, making it a large enclosed chamber. They can be made from eight centimeters, they can be about eight centimeters or three inches high and are cut from foam card. Note that each section requires two foam card wall pieces that will form corners on all of the sections except for the corridor. Cut out all the wall sections, but don't glue them down yet. Arrange them to get an idea of how they will fit together. You might find that some are a bit too long and you'll have to trim them down. That's very good advice. So I'm gonna work on that first step now. Uh, this isn't gonna be used, but it's, I'm gonna just show this to you so you can see what my plans are. First of all, I'm gonna draw on here just to make uh, an idea of where, it's gonna, where things are gonna go. Um, and I'm gonna use this one centimeter thick blue foam, because again, can't really get hold of foam core here, sadly. Um, but this will be quite good. What I might end up doing is drilling a couple of holes and putting some, uh, gluing some um, pins into them so that I can then, when I stick this down, it's got a little bit more rigidity. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the plan. So I'll be getting the proxon out, cutting out a load of eight centimeter high strips from my one centimeter thick blue foam, um, and then working out roughly where it's gonna set. So, so yeah, I'm gonna now get my ruler and my pencil, and I'm gonna draw on this sheet to work out where things are and roughly what dimensions I need. And uh, yeah, I'll pop some music on and you can watch. Well, that went well. I've got it all sketched out. I know roughly my dimensions. I've also read a little bit ahead and realized that I've not done the doorway as wide as they suggest. So I'm gonna um and ah about that, but I'll always, all that'll mean is if I do it wider, then I'll just need to cut down my walls a bit. So what you can see in front of you is I've got my blue foam out and I've not got my prox on. I'm actually not gonna bother with it, um, not for now. Uh, if I can manage to do this just with a knife and a safety ruler, then I'll do that. So let me quickly show you that the width of these is around the 590 mark, 600. And the width of what I need to do is marked on here at around 584, 584, 573. So, this width is pretty much perfect for three of the long lengths and then the side that has the doorway on it, uh, clearly they're going to be two shorter lengths, but they're also going to be able to be cut out of this, which is perfect. So what we'll do is it, oh, sorry, it says eight centimeters. So we're going to mark eight centimeters along the bottom here. I'll do this once and then turn the camera off because it will just be repetitive. So we've got ourselves eight centimeters there. We've got a square, which I am confident is 90 degrees. So we can line that. And then we have my epic, epic straight edge. This is, this one was just crazily expensive, but it is beautiful. It's so heavy and it has like a grippy kind of um, texture on the bottom like a, almost like a cloth and so it just doesn't slip as you can see it's actually hard to move even when you want to move it 
which is perfect really, you want it to be absolutely dead on. So there we are, we've marked that up, we've got that in line. So now we will very carefully and with multiple passes, as you know, cut that down. So that will mark in there. I'm actually gonna extend my blade a little bit. Almost too long, this uh, safety ruler. <laughs> really is good. A really nice straight cut and just a little bit too long at the moment, but I can trim that down. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut out three more of them. That will be all four sides. Uh, and then I will bring you back in for the next step. That went well. I now have four lengths all cut to eight centimeters high there. So the next thing I'm gonna do is skip a step. <laughs> I always say I'm gonna follow these, but then I never do, do I? So the next one, the next step was the doorway, but like I've said, I'm a little unsure as to what the uh, dimensions I'm gonna do it. So I'm just gonna leave that for now and have a think. So we're gonna do step three, which is the platform. The platform runs all the way around the inside of the tomb's walls. We used pink styrene sheet for this job, as it was just the right height and easy to cut. It doesn't say what the right height is, obviously. So that would be too useful. Mark out the styrene into straight lengths about five centimeters or two and a half inches wide and use a hacksaw I'm not going to use a hacksaw top tip uh, to cut them out try to be as accurate as you can because the straighter the cuts the better the styrene will line up with your walls remember that the pieces of the platform will have to be slightly shorter than the cork tiles to allow for the thickness of the foam card walls now I did this measuring so I did measure out and I measured out leaving the centimeter. However, what I've decided to do is be a little more kind of belt and braces. So I'm gonna do the same thing as I did for the blue foam. I'm gonna come along and I'm gonna mark five centimeters out on this, and then I'm gonna cut out four sections that are five centimeters deep, using the same technique with the same tools, and it's gonna make mean that I can then offer it up, mark it and cut it absolutely accurately while it's sat on my board. So, I'll grab a pencil and we'll mark our five centimetres and we'll get our 90 degrees and we will line that and then we'll grab our epic straight edge and then we'll cut it and this will obviously take a few more strikes, a few more strokes. This is two centimetres thick, green foam. So um, it will take a few more strokes in the one centimetre thick, might be two and a half actually, can't remember. But still, we will slice this very carefully with multiple passes, and then it will cut nice and smoothly, like this. There we are. So I'll do that three more times and then probably call it a night to be honest. So, but I'll bring you back for, for the next step when I get to it. Next step on this is to get these walls and the step all trimmed down so that we can uh, glue them in place. And that's what I'm gonna do this evening. So let me show you how I'm gonna go about doing that. So first of all, what I've done is this is gonna be the, the wall here and I'm making use of one of the other sheets here to hold it in place right at the edge and then I can butt that up where I want it to be here okay because my guesstimations weren't exact as I thought and then what I'm going to be able to do is grab myself a pencil and mark out exactly where that nudges up against the edge like this there we are exactly there and on the other side apologies for getting in the way of the camera and then I'll be able to trim that down. So I'm gonna go around and basically do that all the way around. And my idea here is that every, uh, every one will be overlapped. So this will overlap here, this will be overlapped here, um, and therefore I'll be able to potentially even put some pins through to make sure these are to make these a little bit more secure. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna go around and do all the rest of this tr trimming on this, and then I'll do the same technique, but for the, uh, step. So I'll offer the step up um, like so with one of these in the way and then one of those down there and that will then enable me to work out exactly where I'm going to trim. So uh, I'll get those two processes done and then bring you back for the gluing. So I've trimmed all those down. I haven't yet 
done where the doorway is going to be because I still haven't decided on the dimensions. But I think that I can do these three sides now, uh, get them done and then decide on the dimensions and glue that in place maybe first thing tomorrow. Um, I, I might end up going with the way that they described it even though it doesn't really match my understanding. My understanding of it is, is the doorway is quite small. Um, so yes, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm really conflicted. I'll probably pop some music on and speed this up while I do the gluing. Um, I'll show you how I'm going to do it. I'm going to be using my gator glue because I know that that glues to these boards well. And the plan is that I will basically be gluing each side, each wall to each base and then gluing each base to the floor like that so that it's um, and then working my way around. So I'll be doing each one in turn um, and hopefully it'll work. Because <laughs> if it doesn't, then I'll be really annoyed and you'll get to see lots of blooper reel. Um, but no swearing, because I don't swear. So I'm gonna do that, I'll pop some music on and um, you can watch as I glue um, and get this all done and then weight it down and then it'll be good for me to look at tomorrow morning. So what I've realized is that the doorway actually is going to be a whole piece with part of the center cut out to make a kind of angular entrance, which is what they suggested to do, which I am going to do. So I'm going to make it not, I had about eight centimeters wide. I'm going to make it 10 centimeters wide. So I've marked this up, I've measured the center. And so what I'm going to do is uh, work um, out a, a geometric shape here. It's going to just go up and across um, as a kind of uh, mar as, as, a, as a kind of geometric shape. And uh, yeah, we're just going to um, we're just going to see what we can do with this and cut it out. And then I'm going to get it glued in now because I'd rather it was glued in now than than later because um, uh, then I can go off overnight completely and then I can pick the next step up tomorrow without waiting. That glue does dry very very fast as well, a gator glue, so um, I won't be hanging around at all tomorrow morning. So what we'll do is we will just mark out, so we will say, um, we need to make sure it's not going to break, so we will come 1.5 or 15 mil from the top there, um, and then I will mark there, and they're the same, and that will mean that I can then do this as wide as I want it to be. So if we say it's going to be six mil or six centimeters, 60 mil across the top, maybe not 60, maybe 40 mil across the top. Yeah, that'll be about right. So we can basically line ourselves up on both those marks and then go two centimeters either side, which is going to be there. So that's going to be where one of our cuts is going to go. And then if we say that this is, uh, so that is uh, 65 mil. So if we say that the sides are 50 mil, uh, or maybe 45 mil even, then that will be quite a nice kind of shape. But I'll have a look at it first before I cut it, because we'll draw it in. Um, and then when we're happy with the shape, we'll come along with a sharp knife and we'll cut along these lines and remove this section. Um, and then glue it in place. That wasn't very well done. Glue it in place with the step as well. So I'll be happy with that. Hmm. Does it want to be slightly steeper? Does it want to be slightly steeper? I think it might want to be slightly steeper. So let's go for 40. Like that. I think that's better. Yeah. Uh, five mil lower down on the edges. So I'm going to now go and grab my uh, safety ruler and my knife. I'm going to cut along those lines and then we will have a doorway. So let's get it done. There we are. So what we'll do now is we'll offer this up. I will trim down my step to be the right. It will not go obviously all the way to the very end because this butts up against the other angle at one side, they'll be, each be about this wide, 
and then I'll get them all glued in and then I'll leave it, there, leave it to go off overnight. So I'll bring you back when I come to the next step. As hoped for, this has uh, gone off nicely over the, over the evening. So what I'm about to do now is come along and snip off my um, cocktail sticks. So I'm going to go around, oh, pick that up, I'm going to go and do that now. And the next step after that, which I will bring you back for, is I need to um, both uh, have a look at the texture on top of this green uh, and also potentially dented and stuff to make it look a little bit more rubbery. Cut a hole in the back like they suggest. There's a few little bits of dressing to do before I get on to the next step. So I'll first of all clip these off, um, tidy up, and then I will bring you back for the next step. So I've clipped off all of the pegs and that's now fine. So what I'm now gonna do is I'm gonna work on this step. Now, I probably should have done this before sticking them down, but you know, you make mistakes all the time, I certainly do. And so um, this is gonna be slightly more difficult than it should have been. Uh, but fundamentally what I'm gonna be doing, and I won't film all of this because it's gonna be quite hard for me to actually cover it all. But, and it's also gonna sound very nasty. What I'm gonna be doing is basically coming along and shaving the top off that has all of the texture. Now, I was gonna do this, like I said, I, meant, I should have done this before I stuck it down, because this would also give, allow me to give a little bit of a beaten up appearance to the edge, make it a little bit less um, even, and make it look like it is the ruined room that Barlin's tomb was. So I'm going to get that done. I won't run the camera for all of it. You've seen the technique. Um, I'm going to be very careful to not damage the back wall mostly. I will be putting in a gap in the wall somewhere. I'm not sure where yet. I'll bring you along for that to show you how I go about doing that. So I'll be carving out a, a gap um, as, as they do in the instructions. But yeah, I'm just going to go along and we're going to clear off all of the top of the uh, of the platform so that it's not got this kind of cross hatching te uh, texture on it. Well, I've gone around and uh, smoothed off or rather roughed up all the edges and I'm happy with that. If you are going to build this and you do use the uh, same type of XPS as I do, do that before you glue it down. <laughs> You'll find it a lot easier. <laughs> Anyway, that it wasn't too bad. So what I'm now going to do is cut in the gap at the back. And I'm going to do that using and, uh, the Citadel cutter. And literally just going to come in. It's very, very sharp. So you can just come in and carve it out like that. And there we are. So the next step is step huh, number five, which is huh, the steps. Huh. Sorry, been waiting to say that. So on the two front sections near to the door, there are sets of steps leading up to the platforms. These are made out of foam card. Now I don't have foam card, so I will be using the XPS that you can see there. Um, simply cut a long strip of foam card approximately three centimeters wide. Each step should be two centimeters long so the model can step on them, can stand on them. Cut three sections off your strip, the first being two centimeters, the second four, and the third six, then stick them down. So it being two, four, and six, that's two plus four, which is six, plus six, which is 12. So we need to have 12 centimeters, so we can mark that out here. And the first one is gonna be at two, and the second one is gonna be at six, because that's two plus four, there we are. And the third one is gonna be at 12, which will mean that we can make a stepped one. So then what we do is we can mark three centimeters wide, there, and three centimeters up from there. And that is going to be our strip. So let's get that cut out. Using my knife and my safety ruler. And we're going to need two of these, but I'll do the other one off camera because there's no point in repeating myself. There we are. So we've got our initial cut. And what we can now do is cut across at the two and the six. And then we have our steps. So two centimeters. Six centimeters, there we are. And finally, you can see how that gets arranged now. So that'll be a nice steps up. So what I'll do is I will glue them together. Um, I will probably use uh, PVA because I don't want it to spread. Um, and I will just leave that to go off and we'll bring you back for the next section, which um, is gonna be very, very soon. Um, for me even for, and for you. Um, so I'll bring you back from the next section once I've got these um, all glued and stuck in place. Um, so yeah, that's the nice easy step. As promised, step six, which is called alcoves and decoration. I'm gonna do half of this. 
because I'm not sure how I'm going to do the second half, but you'll see why. So alcoves and decoration. To make alcoves, cut several small rectangles of foam card, tall enough to run from the top of the platform to the top of the walls. Then about two centimeters wide. So my gap above the platform, above the steps to the top of the walls is six centimeters. I've got that. Cut a diagonal line as shown to make a roughly triangular shape. So a little bit flat on the top, not quite two centimeters wide at the bottom, clearly. Once you have a shape, draw, uh, shape that you're happy with, you can draw around it to make all the others. We used 18 of these pieces in total, stuck down to form rough alcoves in the wall. So I'm going to do that then. So let's do that. The second part is decorative trim, which I don't have. This is decorative wooden beading. So I might try and find some of that over the weekend if I can get out. Uh, but otherwise, I might end up just carving it myself. But we'll see. So first of all, let's do the alcove. So it's a six centimetre high um, strip um, and two centimetres wide. And if they're saying you need 18, then that's nine of these two centimetre wide strips, which is 18 centimetres. I did that maths in my head. <laughs> so, just, just not wide enough. Ah, okay, so we'll go along the bottom. Um, so, we'll measure to 18 centimeters here. There we are. And we'll measure to 18 centimeters from here. Because I know that that's roughly six. So remember, it's two threes that I cut. So, that should be six. So now we've got that shape, what we can do is we can mark along um, and cut every two centimetres to get our little shapes. So now we've got our shapes. What we can do is we can start to cut them into little triangles. Probably the best way to do this is gonna be for me just to put a little mark because I won't be able to see both edges with my ruler and so I might make a mistake. So if I just do that, that'll be accurate enough. Okay, we've marked all of those. So now we can come along with the ruler and comfortably cut between those two edges, those two points knowing that we're gonna get them about the same shape. So I'll get that done on all, on all of these. Okay, now they're all cut up. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick them in place. So I will shift things around a bit, bring the board over, and you can see how I'm gonna do that. You can see this is where the steps are being held down with these weights. So the idea for these alcoves is that they slot around the edges like this. So you're going to glue them in place, one there, one there, one there. So we've got 19, so what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to place them roughly where I want them to go, because I do want them to be geometric and, and well spaced, even if they are a little bit looking a little bit kind of knackered now that it's a little bit old. Um, I think that what they suggest that you do um, is you have them quite close together, um, but we'll place them until I'm happy. So currently three on a side. I think maybe we might do four on a side. Um, looks like my hole is gonna be near one. Um, let's have some on these near edges as well. So what do I have left? I've got one, two, three, four, five, six seven left so um, yeah I might just leave them I'm, I'm happy with that I don't want it to be too over the top too cluttered um, but they will add a little bit of not very much but a little bit of um, interest and in maybe some cover as well um, if I add one more on each side I've still got four so if I then add I've still got two. I think that's gonna be enough. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna glue these on. So what I've got is my PVA glue. Um, I'm gonna use a little tray, a little uh, dinner plate. And we're gonna put the PVA, not on that side, on the 90 degree on the side that's gonna go against the wall. <laughs> so make sure you get that right when you're gluing these. Otherwise it won't be looking very good at all. So those are the two edges that are actually going to be um, actually touching something. And I really should measure this, and I probably will do, so I'll just show you this on the camera and then I'll come back and move it. Because what I'm gonna be doing is using dressmaker's pins to hold it in place so it doesn't get knocked. Because I am clumsy and I have that problem that I might knock it. So we'll just take a, a dressmaker's pin and push it in. It will be pulled out again, this is not going to stay, so it doesn't need to go all the way in, but you can just press that, push that in, and that will then hold it in place so that, uh, like I say, so it doesn't get knocked. 
So what I'm going to do now is go along, measure roughly where these are, are going to go so I can get it um, equidistant and then glue them all in place and um, then I'll bring you back for the next step afterwards. The next step is the broken doors. So I'm doing it slightly differently to how the instructions say, obviously, as I always do, but let me read out what it says. Take the two pieces of foam card that were cut out to form the doorway and draw around them onto a thin sheet of balsa wood. Carefully cut these out using the craft knife and steel rule, leaving you with two door-shaped pieces of wood. Score into the wood with a blunt pencil or pen to make impressions of planks, just as you did for the Rohan building in Pack 10. You can take the detailing a step further if you wish by cutting the door into pieces with a jagged edge to represent splintering. Once you're ready, use PVA glue to stick the doors to the base near to the doorway. So, I'm going to do most of that but I don't have the two halves. So what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna offer up my sheet of balsa here, just the other side of the doorway. And I'm gonna come in with my pencil and I'm gonna mark out the shape on it. As simple as that. Now I was considering doing a, um, doing the doors opening and shutting rather than splintered or having one still on the wall one still attached and one not. And I might still do that. But what I need to do first of all is cut this out. You can see I've got the shape there now. Cut that out and uh, cut it in half so I've got two doors and do the scoring of the wood grain. So I'll get that done, I'll bring you along for that. So I'll just clear that away, get it cut out and then I'll show you how I'm gonna do the wood grain. That is now cut out as you can see and I'm now going to do the planks for it. So I'm going to go with the grain and what we'll do is just with a propelling pencil that doesn't have the lead out, I'm just going to come along and mark in where these planks may be. You can see that I've not yet broken it up into pieces, that's because I'm currently still deciding exactly how I'm going to arrange this, whether I'm going to have it swinging with a with a pivot or not. So I'm going to just get this done in terms of painting and well in terms of marking it out like this um, and maybe I'll put some steel binds down um, so that that's because at the moment it's a, it, it needs a little bit more decoration but that's how we're going to go about doing that and then so that you can match up what you do is you come along and you score the end and then you're going to be able to do the other side as well. So I'll get these done and then I think I'm going to put these to one side and think like I say I'm going to move on to the next step. So these won't actually get finished straight away but that's fine. The next step is the pillars which is going to be a lot of fun. So I'll get this job finished and I'll bring you back for the next step when I get to it. Well, while I think about the door and how I'm going to arrange it let's move on to the next section which is the pillars. And so now we're on step one, which is the columns. The pillars are made from the same polystyrene ceiling tiles as Pack 19's lake, which you can see in front of you there, that's what I've got there. For each of the pillars, uh, you will need six of them. For each of the pillars, mark out four rectangles onto the ceiling tile, about 14 centimeters long and three centimeters wide. Stick these rectangles together with PVA to make an oblong tube. Leave these tubes to dry thoroughly, as they will be a little fragile for a while. And that's a... Uh, <laughs> It's an understatement ever I heard one. So what I'm going to do is I've cut off the edges already of two sides of this. Because it's going to be easier for me to mark on the other side and get, the, get everything cut correctly rather than where there's a lip um, and also where it's a little, got a little bit of, a, of more texture. So we'll come along now, we'll get ourselves a pencil and we'll mark out at 3, 6, 9 and 12. If I open the pencil, it's still shut from doing the marking for the door. So there's three, there's six, there's nine, and there's twelve. Okay, so that's going to be uh, the width of this pillar. What we'll now do is we'll come along with my 90 degrees, and at each of those lengths I will just draw up. Now you'll notice I'm not worrying about drawing the length yet, or the height, or whatever the other dimension because I'm actually just going to cut out these strips and then 
When I've got these strips, I will then measure out, trim them down, find out what I'm missing and cut some more because I'm a bit lazy. So let's get that measured out and then we'll cut it. With that done, what I can now do is take my Uber Super safety ruler. This really is just my favorite thing that I've bought this year, I think. <laughs> Never mind about that airbrush that I'm scared of using. Having a good safety ruler. And then let's cut these strips out. An alternative for this would be to get the Proxon out, uh, which may give a slightly cleaner cut, but I uh, just can't be bothered. And this is gonna be fine. There we are, we have the four lengths. I'm now just going to tie it up a bit and I'll bring you back for the next step. So the next one is to cut these to about 14 centimeter lengths. So let's see how many I'm gonna be able to get out of each of these uprights. There's one, there's two, and there's three. So I'm gonna to need to cut four more strips to get six because obviously, um, I've got three pillars here and I'll have three pillars in the other four. So um, I'll get that done off camera. I won't repeat this process on camera. But so what we're gonna do is we're gonna mark that at 14 centimeters, then mark that at 14 centimeters, and then cut each one out, just like that. So always use a safety ruler. And like I say, you could get your hot wire cutter out, but with a sharp blade and care, it's certainly possible and okay to cut this bobbly polystyrene. It's not ideal, but it is okay. So what I'm now gonna do is sit and cut all of these out and then cut four more strips and cut them out as well. Um, and I'll bring you back when I get to the gluing stage. I have a big pile of sections now. Apologies for the banging in the background. The men are working outside in the corridor. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stick them together. And I am gonna make use of dressmaker's pins just to make them a little bit more secure and these ones I will not be pulling out. I'll be pushing them basically right through because they're gonna, not gonna cause a problem then. They're not so big that they'll go push right through and, and potentially stab you so they can be added as a, uh, as a precaution. So what I'm gonna be doing here, and I won't do all of this on camera because it's very repetitive, and I'll probably just potter through this through the day. I've just got two minutes after a long business call. <laughs> I need to get away from my desk. <laughs> just stop going mad. So I thought I'd just make a start and put together the first one of these and I'll continue through the day making these little columns. So we'll put a bead of PVA on the edge of that. Then we will overlap it like so. And then with that in place, we will be able to push in some pins to hold it and secure it, like that. Okay, and then another pin towards the bottom. And the only other thing really to highlight here is how we're going to be arranging this. Just make sure that you don't do what I just did then. Make sure you push them in flat. So the only thing, other thing to point out is this one overlaps that one, which means that that is going to overlap this one, and which means that then you'll make a square rather than a rectangle. So again, apologies for the banging. So let's pop some more PVA down here. And like I say, I'll just leave these to dry over the day and I'll do a little bit every, every hour or so, come and make another one. I've got to make six of these, it said, didn't it? So it'll be a, uh, an all day job to get all of them done, but that's fine. It's a marathon, not a race, fortunately. There's no time schedule on this one, really. What I have realized is I'm gonna have to pull out the top pin, just what I've been thinking, um, because we actually cut a shape so I'll push that in like that because you actually end up cutting a shape out of the top of the of this and I, I'm gonna need to pull that metal out otherwise I won't be able to cut the shape. So I'll need to get in and extract that one. But I'm about to do that with, with tweezers um, and I'll do that not on camera. 
because it might involve swearing. And it may indeed involve breaking it. If that's the case, that's fine, because I did actually make too many of these sides. So we'll just put some glue there, and then on the side, and then we've made our first one. So, <laughs> so to reiterate, we're going to be able to push the pins at the bottom right the way in and not worry because they don't need to come back out. However, the pin at the top should be pushed in just a little bit, not all the way because we're going to need to pull that out before we cut the shape. So just bear that in mind, that's a little mistake which I will now rectify. I'll let you know if I rectify it or if I just damage it. The alternative is, is I could use this one as the damaged um, which is going to be cut in half. So maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll just do that. There we are. Oh, no, that came out. You can see this is a good idea but you need to be accurate and careful. There we are. So we'll put a pin at the top as well just to absolutely secure it. There we are. And we have our first column. So I now need to do that five more times and uh, I'll bring you back for the next step when I get to it. So we're on to step two of the pillars. It's been a couple of days actually because I've been crazily busy and haven't been able to get any time away. So step two is making the indents. Next, to make the indent on the corners of the pillars, you will need to create a template out of thin card. Cereal packet is ideal. I've got some uh, old uh, dog, <laughs> dog packet, dog food packet. And mark out a rectangle approximately 10 centimeters by two centimeters. Draw a line down the center lengthways. At one end, mark out a triangle so that your template is an arrow shape. Cut out this obelisk shape with scissors or a craft knife. Lightly score along the center line with a craft knife, then fold it in half. Now, by positioning this template on the corners of your pillars and drawing around it, you will have a perfect guideline for the indents. These indents only run around the tops of the pillars, so be sure to leave the other end untouched. Use a hot wire cutter to cut the indents out of each corner. So let's get that done. So first of all, what we'll do is we will mark out about 10 centimeters down here and then we'll mark about two centimetres across and draw that line and then we'll mark about two centimetres across there and then we'll check that that's ten centimetres which it is so now we've got our template shape and what we can now do is cut that out and uh, start to, um, to start to do the task that they describe what I will also do actually while it's here is just mark the centre line as well there we are. And I may as well actually mark the triangle, then I'll just cut the triangle out. So I'm going to do um, about one and a half centimetres down for the triangle. It doesn't say the size to do, so that'll be fine. So what we'll now do have is a triangle uh, shape there. So I'll cut that out using my craft knife um, and a safety ruler, um, and then we will bring the pillars over and get the hot knife, hot, the, one of the uh, hot knives I've got and, um, and we'll cut them out. So I'll get that done and I'll show you what I'm doing when I'm doing the, when I'm doing the actual pillars. This next step is quite fiddly. I've just practiced on one uh, and I'm relatively happy to now show you on camera. Um, these are stuck together but not in very not very well in some cases this may be a bad example to put on camera but anyway we shall see so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to offer up my template and draw around it okay and I'll do that on all the corners while the um, pillar is at its most stable okay so I'll get that done Okay, with that done, what I want you to notice is, is that this template is too big for the thickness of the polystyrene that I've got. So bear that in mind when you're doing this. 
Don't follow instructions blindly, otherwise you'll end up breaking things. So I have my hot wire cutter here from Hot Wire Foam Factory. I tried with the wand, but I just can't get that damn thing to work. So I found, I found it much, much easier with this. And what I'm doing is, I was turned on now, so very, very, very carefully and very inaccurately, what I'm doing is this. And you can see that it's possibly gonna take me multiple passes because I'm a bit shaky and I'm not very accurate. But you get the general impression and you get the shape that you're looking for, so it's close enough. And what you want to really be careful of is that you don't go right the way through. It's very, very close to going right the way through, as you can see, it's paper thin. Um, and that is a bit of a concern for me, but we shall see how it goes as I go forwards. So what I'm going to do now is do that for this one and then the other five, because I've done one, as I say earlier, um, just now, uh, just as a practice, um, which is here, which is looking okay. I'm pretty pleased. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think it's horrible. It's not great, but it's not horrible. So yeah, I'll get that finished and then I'll bring you back for the next step, which is going to be the tops of these pillars. So the next step is the tops of the pillars. What I've got here is I've got the same polystyrene I've used to make all the rest of these pillars. So I'm just going to turn that over so that it's got its smooth side to face me. Draw around the top of your pillar onto a ceiling tile. It is easier to do this if you draw onto the flat side, there we are, uh, than the textured side. You'll be left with a small octagon. Use a hot wire cutter to cut it out of the tile. Now I'm actually finding that I can use the um, my uh, standing knife quite effectively so I don't need to use a hot wire cutter so what we're going to do is we're going to come along here and we're going to basically draw around the tile draw around the top on the tile like this now my my pillars are not a regular shape because I didn't do them accurately enough but that should be fine so then what we could do is we can come along and as you can see I am actually able to cut with this very sharp knife without causing a problem. So once we've cut out the basic square shape, then we'll be able to cut the corners off and then we'll be able to glue it in place. And it is a simple process. It doesn't take very long at all. So we've cut that. So now we're gonna take the corners off along the lines that we've marked. And as you see, we're not getting too much bobbling, so it's okay. A hot wire cutter may be a better option but I'm finding this sharp knife is doing quite well. So we then have some PVA on this plate um, and I've got my little brush here. So what we'll do is we will brush the PVA to the top of the pillar, like so, and then rest the top on top of it. I'm trying to make it so that it matches roughly. There we are, that'll do. So that's how we're putting the top on these pillars. So I'm going to now do that on, uh, the, on the others. I'm not going to do it on the one that I'm going to have as a broken pillar. There's no point, I don't need to. So I've just got three more to do like that. Um, and then I'll bring you along for the next step when I get to it. The next step is going to cover two steps. And you'll see what I mean in a second. So we're going to do step four detailing for the pillars. But this is also going to allow us to do decoration um, on, on the actual surround of the on the on, around inside the actual tomb so let me read this the base of the pillar needs weighing down and decorating the fastest and easiest way to do this is to stick some more of your decorative wooden beading which as you all know I don't have around the bottom edge so what I'm going to do instead of using decorative beading is I'm going to use dash clay so I've got a brand new unopened pack and this arrived which I was very pleased about so I ordered it for this which is the green stuff world dwarven roller and there's going to be some stuff in here which I'll be able to use to decorate around the base of the pillars and also to roll out and stick on the edge of the platform. So that's going to be my plan. So this is going to take a little while. I'll probably do this over several days because I'm, I'm just grabbing like two minutes now uh, just before I go back to work after lunch. And uh, yeah, so what we'll do is we'll get our air dry clay, we'll roll it out and then we will use the... Uh, textured roller to get some texture and then I will wrap that around the base of each of the pillars so I will get that done I'll leave the camera rolling and pop some music on it is a technique you've seen before so I'll probably speed this up quite a lot mm -hmm. 
I've been umming and ahhing a little bit about the next step on this for a little while and uh, I think I've come to a decision. So I've decided to not put the detailing on the edge of the platform. The detailing has gone very nicely on the bottom of the pillars and I think that I'm just going to leave it at that. So what I'm going to do and what I've decided I need to do now is a step that's not in the instructions and it's just a, a step caused by um, how I've done it. If I'd done with cork then I wouldn't need to do this but because I haven't I'm going to need to paint on some texture to the bottom of this and I'll probably paint it all around. So this is some of my grout and sand or dust more PVA and water mix. I've made it very very dry which hopefully will mean that it will go on nice and thick and evenly. Um, just stipple it on and brush it on and don't worry too much about tidiness and uh, that will now give this a little bit of texture for when we come along to do the dry brushing later on. Um, and I'm doing this now so that it's covered over because the next official step is to put rubble and, and what have you all around and if there's white underneath it then it won't look very good. So I'll get this done, I'll pop some music on and uh, do this very quickly. There we go, that's done. So I'll let that dry and I'll come back and do the next step. Okay, the next step is to start detailing the tomb. Now, step one of this says the broken pillar. Take one of your six pillars, and I'm gonna use this one, the one that I didn't, um, I pushed the, if you remember, I pushed the needle right the way in, uh, the pin right the way in, so I couldn't then cut down that side correctly easily. Um, cut a, well, Roughly cut away the top third with a hot wire cutter. Now I'm just, I'm not going to use a hot wire cutter for this because it, I don't need to. I'm going to make use of my sharp knife and um, I'll just cut it in a kind of, um, and it does say keep the top section safe, you'll need it in step three. Um, so I presume that you're going to be using this for making the well from the looks of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to come along with our knife and we're just going to kind of like cut in and do it at a ragged angle. Being careful not to cut my hands and being careful not to destroy the whole thing. There we are. So we have half of a half of a pillar now. So that's what we want to do. So what it says is check the original plan for the position of the ruined corner section, which is going to be over here in this corner here, because this is where the hole is. Um, and because we wanted the rubble to surround the room pillar, it seemed easier to stick it down before adding the rocks and pebbles to your board. So you stick the pillar down with PVA. Once the pillar is stuck, pour a little PVA glue into the hole in the top and begin to stuff small pieces of polystyrene and a few bits of gravel into it. Add more glue and stick even more bits of polystyrene into it. Repeat this process until the hole has been completely filled. Now, I'm not gonna do that because that's completely wasteful. You don't need to fill that. What we need to do is we just need to fill the top of this so we can get a little bit of, of XPS or foam or something, or if you've got squirty expanding foam, squirt that in there, let it go off, and then we can glue just a very small amount of rubble over the top. So that's for, that's for later. Um, what I'm doing from first of all, is I will glue this down into place. So we'll do that just using some PVA as it suggests. So I'll run a bead of PVA around the inside not around the base of this, like that. And we'll stick it down, making sure that it's roughly an even, even distance from each step. There we are. Right, so I will let that to go off. Um, I haven't yet decided whether I'm gonna stick these other ones down or not. I probably won't. It does make some sense to have them movable, make them a bit easier to, uh, to play around. Um, and, and yeah, it is just pretty cool. Um, what I'm gonna do um, while that's drying is I am actually gonna do the scattering of the terrain around the ruin pillar. And the main reason for doing this is this is actually gonna then bind in um, to the ruin pillar and help it stick a bit better. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna drizzle some PVA like this um, get yourself a brush and spread it out and then drop your sand and gravel mix onto the PVA and then when you're done with that what I will do is drop some 99% alcohol onto the top of the 
rubble and then put some more PVA on top of that and that will then seal it all together into one. Now what we're actually going to do is have some rubble up here as well. I possibly should have painted this first but we're just going to kind of hope that we can fill it in. So I'll put a load of PVA in this corner like so and this potentially will be a process that might take me quite a bit of time, a couple of days while it goes off. So I probably won't film the entirety of the process, but I will bring it back for when we start to, when we block off that and start to fill it up. So I'm now gonna go and grab my sand and I'm going to scatter it around and I'll put some music on so you can watch. There you are. So what you saw was I used some alcohol to reduce the surface tension of the glue so that it would then soak right through and then a dropper with my terrain glue which you can find a link to in the description below of how I make that uh, and that will now need to dry probably in this current climate. It'll probably take a couple of days to dry fully so I'm just going to leave that alone now. Um, might just get a little bit more. I also used a three different grades of my sifted sand from the largest to not quite the smallest. I'm not going to use any of the smallest because it really is very fine. But I'm just scattering a little bit of the second smallest, what I call grade number two, just over the top. And that will now look really, really nice when that's dried. So I'm going to let that go off um, and I'll bring you back for the next step very shortly, which we'll be filling this in, which I might do now. Uh, I'm just going to tidy up, clean up. I've made a bit of a mess just past the edge of the wall here. Um, and unfortunately, my uh, magazine is right there, which is a bit clumsy of me. So I'm just going to tidy that up and I'll bring you back to show you how I'm going to fill this in um, and make that look like it's full of rubble as well. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to fill the top of this in with some polystyrene and then we'll scatter some rubble over the top. And what I've got is some of the leftovers from when I was making these. So I'm going to do this very, very roughly. Just cut it down into shape because it doesn't need to be perfectly accurate. Uh, but we don't want, we want to be able to put it roughly inside. So it needs to be a little bit smaller actually than the top of and, and the gap that we've got. So we can just shove it in and glue it in place with some PVA. And when that's gone off, we can drop some more of the gravel on. So that's gonna fit. So what we'll do now is we will put some PVA around the edges of this, or we could even shove it in and put the PVA on top. That may very well work just as well. So let's see if we can do that. I'm a little bit, I should possibly have done this before stick it in place, but that's going to be fine. So we can just drop a little bit of PVA in like that. That will hold it in place. And then when that's dried, what we'll be able to do is put some gravel in and we're not going to waste quite as much gravel and PVA while trying to fill up that rubble, that pillar. We only will have to fill up that very little bit at the top. So there we are. I'm going to let that to dry now and I'll bring you back for the next step shortly. This is dry, rock solid overnight, which is really, really cool. I didn't expect it to dry that fast. However, what this does mean is I'm now a little bit behind. <laughs> well, I could actually be moving on to the next step. However, what I need to do first is fill in this. So I'm going to put a bead of glue just around the edge. I don't want to overload this because by accident, I've actually got quite a nice little texture in there anyway because I used the lumpy XPS, XPS, white foam. So we're just going to grab some of the same sands that we used before. So a little pinch of the larger sands, just drop it in. And then some of the slightly, slightly smaller. And then when that's dried, then that can be painted. So yeah, let's put that in like that. There will be some loose, which will need to be uh, cleaned off. And then we'll put a little bit of more PVA in so I can put some of the smaller stuff in and then it'll be done. So just as quick as that, and I'll let that to, to dry as well. And uh, that shouldn't take too long. And then I'll bring you back for the next step when, uh, when it's ready. We've got a very close to the end now. The next step is gonna be making the well, which won't take me very long, and making the sarcophagus, which probably will take me ages because that involves painting on the 
dwarven for uh, which is probably the hardest part of this whole thing. So anyway, there we are. So I'll let that dry and I'll bring you back for the next step shortly. First of all, apologies for the bad light. We've been without power all day, which is a bit of a pain. So I've got no lights. So I'm getting this done very quickly. I haven't been able to work either, which is even more of a pain because having a hobby like this isn't cheap. Anyway, next for step three of detailing the tomb, which is the well. Making the well is very quick and easy. Simply take the top half of your broken pillar, turn it upside down and use a hot wire cutter to carefully slice it to size. You'll be left with an octagonal well. Dwarves never make anything circular. Cut out a square of foam card, roughly five centimeters square, and stick the well in the center of the PVA glue. So here I've got my off cut, which I can cut, and here I've got some black foam, which I will also be able to cut up. So I am going to, again, not use a hot wire cutter because I haven't got it out and I can't be bothered to go and get it, and I have no power, so I can't. So what I'm gonna do is very, very carefully cut this which is probably going to be quite hard because it's actually falling apart already because it wasn't very well glued. So I may find that actually before I do this, I am going to want to pin it. So I'm going to grab my pins and put a few more in, just so that it doesn't fall apart on me. Because right now, as you can see, it really is. So I'll stick some pins in it. one and these will get covered up when when the whole thing gets painted so it's not a problem and there's another nope do it a little bit shallower than that fortunately it's too small for these pins these pins are a little bit too long this might end up going very badly wrong let's see if we can cut it haha -ha! I did it and it didn't fall apart, isn't that amazing? Right, so what I'm now gonna do is cut out a square of this black foam that I've got here. So I have my marks on there, so I can see where five centimeters is. And I can see where five centimeters is. And there we are, we've got a rough square of five centimeters and I will now glue that on using PVA and let that to go off. So we'll put some PVA. It's a bit wonky this. There we are, we'll glue that down. And I'll also put just a double super glue and then I'll get a brush and I'll smear that down the inside so that will now reinforce the, the sides as well. So there we are, we've got ourselves a little well. Uh, I'm now going to do that with the brush and then what we'll do is we'll start on the sarcophagus which is going to be done in a very similar way um, using some blue foam this time, which I've just got here. As you can see, I'm trying to take advantage of not working and get some stuff done, but unfortunately having no power means that the light's very bad. So I'll put that to one side, and then we will look at the sarcophagus. So the sarcophagus. To construct the sarcophagus, we used two toothpick holders. Now, I don't have two toothpick holders, so I'm just going to move straight on to the alternative approach, a foam card sarcophagus. Another way to make the sarcophagus is to construct it out of foam. Cut out four rectangles of foam card. Two should be five by three, and two should be six by four. Stick the two smaller pieces together, but what I'll be doing is I'll be using my one centimeter blue foam for that, and then stick the, the larger pieces on top and bottom. So let's get some cutting done. Um, we'll get the safety roller this time because I want to be a little bit more accurate than I was just guessing then. So the, this is gonna want to have a square which is roughly two by three inches, five centimeters by, so it said five by three centimeters. So we'll grab ourselves a pencil and we'll mark this out and cut it out. And when that's done, I will bring you back to show it being stuck together. With absolutely the last of the light, <laughs> let's get these glued together. So one thing I have just done is I've also beveled the edges of this top just to make it a little bit more fancy. So what we'll do is we'll put some, some glue on the middle bit. Now, if you're doing this with how they've described it, you'll need to glue those two together, but it's gonna be easier for me to do that. And then stick that down on top and then put some glue on the top smear it around and then put the beveled one on top and then that is the sarcophagus done. 
Now don't overload this with PVA because you don't need lots of PVA for it to make a good seal. And lots of PVA actually sometimes can make it dry very slowly. So there we are. So I'll just put that on top. And what I'll do is I will now clamp that because, well, you know me and clamps. So very, very loosely clamp it and then we can shift to make sure it's central and then when we're happy with its positioning, tighten the clamp and then get one more and drop that on and I'll leave that to dry. Hopefully the power will come back and hopefully next time uh, we'll have some light and you'll be able to see a little bit more what I'm doing. I've been staring at these doors and I've not glued them in or painted them. And the reason why I've worked out is because I've done them wrong. I'm not very happy with how they are. I've done the planks crossways. I'm sure that's potentially a legit legitimate way that you can do doors, but I'd rather have them upright. And so what you can see, I have done some other ones, which I've got one side and then I've got the broken up pieces. Uh, and I'm gonna glue this one in so that it's actually standing upright and it's kind of like a jar. And then these ones will be scattered onto the floor like in the uh, instructions. So what I brought you along on this video for is just some very, very basic thing is I would like to have some iron bands on this door. I want to have it for two reasons. One, it will look cool and two, it is a bit flimsy because it's only balsa wood. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this cardboard, which is a, just an older uh, pedigree chum box. <laughs> Not that you could see that because of where the light is. It is a pedigree chum box. And I'm going to draw basically around the shape here, like that, just so that I've got the width exactly. Um, and we'll cut that out now just using a knife. And we'll get some strips of cardboard. And then what we'll do is we will glue that in place onto the door. And uh, yeah, when that's glued and dried, then I'll be able to come along with the paint and uh, paint them silver or metallic or whatever I decide to do. And then it will both look good and also add to the structural integrity of the door. So yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. I'll get these strips cut out and glued on and I will bring you back for the painting step. There we are. So we just need to cut that now down into some into uh, the correct dimensions that we want, and it'll be it'll be good. So maybe five mil across, about that, four or five mil across. There we are. And what we'll do is we will just glue them in place with the coloured side down. So we'll glue one there, and we'll glue one there. And then we'll glue them on the other side and I might do, I might actually put them so there's three. So let me cut another two of those dimensions and then that will look really good I think. For glue I'm going to use PVA. I'm not in a major hurry for this. So just a little bit of PVA um, on the bottom of each of these bits of cardboard and then that will dry overnight and then I can come to the painting next. So I'll just put a little bit of PVA on my plate and then just run the bead down the back of the, of the cardboard and then put it in place, just like that. So what I'll do is I'll glue the rest of them in place, let them dry, and then the next step for the door will be the painting. It has got to the time in this video to have a look at my previous attempt, um, which I had all the sorts of high hopes for when I started it, but it just never really happened and it's really frustrating because I put a lot of effort and time into it and it's in a lot of my early vlogs you'll see videos of this but I've not touched it for ages and I'm now going to take it apart. I did it on a cardboard base that was the first mistake. I did manage to get the warp out as you can see but that took some doing. I didn't take the texture off of my foam which I have managed to hack off on this other one. I made the same mistake twice, what does that say? Uh, but I attempted to get rid of it with some uh, application on this side of filler, which just didn't work. And if I turn it around, on this side, I used Luke's modeling compound, which worked a lot better as you can see, and you really can't see the texture. 
Now the concept of it was, was that I was going to have this as a display board uh, for dwarves, so for photographing dwarves, um, and have this as playable. And it kind of has worked. I mean, it's a good concept. Uh, you can see, I mean, it's a pretty hefty bit of kit. Um, you, you can get in everywhere. I've done it quite high, a lot higher than this one I'm building now. I had some 3D printed um, pillars here which were actually designed to look like they came from the film which is pretty good and then inside I've got all of the parts that were actually in the Barlin's tomb from Games Workshop so I've got the real tomb and I painted them up but it never really like I say it never really kind of worked and that happens sometimes I suppose doesn't it uh, I'm standing here looking at this not wanting to take it apart because well, I did put a lot of time and effort into it, but it really isn't any point in having two Barlin's tombs. And there's stuff in here like these pillars, which I can use on a different project, um, and they'll work really well. I could use them as make a scatter terrain or something for a dwarf kind of build. What I might do is uh, I might cut down here, but then what's the point? I mean, I could have a little bit of a display board, I suppose. So I could save this um, end and have it as a display board as initially planned for this part and that could still work leave the door in you can see i didn't finish painting it but it does open and shut or it did uh, yeah they do they, they work they're the official doors from the games workshop one as well so i could i could do that that might be what i'll do but i'm almost certainly going to take everything that's inside this side out and at the very and probably cut down here and just get rid of that back section and maybe uh, maybe i will keep that front section so there we are that's my extra material that isn't from the magazine for this month sometimes things don't work that's why we enjoy this project in my or this this hobby in one sense because we're creating stuff but often no, not often but sometimes creating stuff doesn't work out and you get to that point where you need to decide whether you're going to bin it or whether you're going to save it and i think having made such a much better barlin's tomb this time around following the instructions in the magazine i think it's time for this to go to the great hobby room in the sky um, and uh, I will recover and let's just make that irrevocable there we are I will recover these cool 3d printed um, pillars put them back in my stash and they can be used for something else and I'll dig out the uh, um, dig out the, the rest of the, of the materials that are in here but the rest of the terrain that's in here let's pull this one out there we are that was well stuck <laughs> so yeah I'll take this apart and uh, recycle what I can, and uh, then, yeah, there we are. Sad, a bit sad, but uh, I'm happy with the new one. We have nearly finished. We are on painting your model. Almost every part of the tomb, including all the components, such as the pillars, well, and sarcophagus, which you can see on the far end of my shot right now, over there we're on, the, on the baking tray, uh, they will need to be painted. We'll benefit from a coat of textured paint. Leave the wooden doors, these are down here, I'll paint them separately in a different clip because uh, you want the wood grain to show through. If you're using black texture paint then this will also serve as an undercoat. However, if you don't have any black texture paint then you'll have to undercoat the model separately with black acrylic paint. Take extra care when painting the rubble as it has lots of hard to reach gaps or cracks. So using a large old dry brush, oh, large old brush, dry brush all the textured areas with the dark gray color. I'm getting ahead of myself there. What I'm gonna be using is I've mixed up some black grout and some of the dusty sand from my back garden <laughs> that I use a lot. Um, and I've got that here in a pot just on the right. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put that over basically the steps and the walls, the top of the walls, and all of these uh, different elements here as well. Uh, and over the back here, everything. So we're gonna cover everything, um, and uh, maybe even put a little bit more onto the uh, base as well. So I'm just gonna get that done. Um, I will pop some music on, and you can watch. This is gonna take a time, and I'm gonna to need to mix some more up. So I'll stop recording now, and I'll bring you back when it's all completed. The textured paint made with the grout and sand has dried and I'm really glad that I actually held off on applying it on the base of my pillars because you can't really see, I'll try and get a close up, it's not going to show up very well because when I put it onto this one here which is the damaged one, it's completely and utterly obscured all of the detail from the roller which is quite frustrating. But anyway we're now rushing towards conclusion. What I've got is my big vat of house paint, black house paint, 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the whole lot of it um, with this just to give it another coat and to make sure that it's, there's no white patches and then we can come in with the dry brush. And what I will also do, be doing is painting up the bottoms and all of these um, pillars and with just the paint the detail does still show, does show, still show through, easy for me to say. So I'm going to get that done. I've got a few minutes now just uh, on, a, on lunch break. Let's get that done, get that drying, and then I'll be able to uh, do the dry brushing a bit later on. So yeah, I'll turn the camera off. You've seen people painting before. I've finished doing the first coat of black. I may end up doing another one around the outside, um, but it's looking good so far. So now what we're going to do is we're going to come along with my raw rumber, yes, and we're going to just apply that first coat over the top of the wood which is going for the going to be for the doors. Now they show you painting this when it's actually been put on the diorama but I think I'd rather paint it here, let it dry, get it exactly how I want it to and then glue it in place. So we've got the two sections, we've got the broken ones which I'm doing now and what I'll do, this dries very fast, so this is just the beginning of my lunch break, same time as I did the other one. So I will quickly paint these in, and I'm now also going to paint onto the whole one. Now you'll notice that I'm not worrying about going over the bands, and the reason for that is I'll come back in later with metallic paint, and having a dark base when you're painting metallic paint actually helps, so this will help to get a better, a better steel look. So yeah, so this dries very quickly as I was just saying. So what I'll do is I'll go and have my lunch and then come back and do the other side afterwards because it'll all be dry. So I didn't want that to happen because it will stick to my metal little metal cooling tray. So there we are, we'll get that, leave that to dry for 10, 15, 20 minutes and then I'll come back and do the other side. Um, and um, I'll show what it looks like when it's finished and when I'm about to glue this one particularly in place, which is when which is what I'm really looking forward to, the half open one. Black paint's all dry, still may want to do another coat on the outside, but inside is perfect. So what I'm gonna do now is the next stage, which is dry brushing. So I have two different colors of gray here, and I have a big old brush that I bought from a hardware store, which works really, really well. It does shed some uh, hairs sometimes, but as long as you pay attention to that, it's really good for dry brushing. Now, I know you've seen dry brushing over and over again, but I'm gonna leave the camera running because I love this stage. It is, it is purely my favorite stage when you're doing painting. Um, the, transla the translation that this causes, the difference that this makes, it was eye-opening to me the first time I did it, and I still love it. So I'll pop some music on, and you can watch as I dry brush Barlin's tomb. I just love that, I really do. Love watching the dry brush come out. So what I'm gonna do now is the second dry brush, which is gonna be with the lighter paint. So I'm just gonna grab a different brush. It's only been a few minutes since I did this. And I've got a lighter gray, and this is gonna to need to be done very, very much lighter. So I would definitely get my rag to start with and take most of the paint off. And I also won't be going over the whole of it. So I'll be just going over the tops of the highest points and around the edges. It is under, underground after all, so I'm not gonna do very much, just take a couple of minutes. I have already dry brushed the other items, which I'll show you in a second when I've done this. Um, and then we're nearly done. I just need to glue on the broken um, doors and put the other door in place. Now that the dry brush is finished. That's done. So here you can see that we have the columns and they are gonna look really good set in place. Really nearly done here. Just got finishing touches to do. And then hopefully, if we get time, a little bit of a surprise, but you'll have to wait to see that. So there we are. That's looking really nice. So what I'll do now is get myself set up and we will put the We'll glue the, uh, the doors in place, um, the broken doors. I'm not quite finished on the one to glue in place as the half open one. I still need to do the steel, so I'll get that done as well. 
So you can see where this door is going to go. I'm going to have it on that side. So we're just going to scatter some of these around, glue them in place. Just get some PVA glue. That's all I need to do just to hold it in place. It will dry nice and hard and but they will definitely won't move. So I'll just run that bead of PVA glue along the bottom edge because I want that one to actually be up on the uh, propped up a bit just to make a bit of a interest. So like that. It's definitely exploded out. And then we'll glue these flat ones in place. And the final process will be trying to do the runes on the temp on the um, on Barlin's actual tomb, which I think I am going to give a go. Um, I haven't yet totally given up on that idea. It's out of my comfort zone that. So uh, I probably should do it because you never learn anything if you don't try. So those can now dry and then I will get the steel done on this, um, uh, paint the steel on the other door and then we'll bring you along for that and then glue that in place. And then the last thing will be, as I say, to do the runes on top of Barland's tomb. But I am quite pleased with how that's looking now. That really has come together very well. So let's do the fin finishing touches. So what we've got here is I've got my silver paint from Vallejo and I've also just got a little bit of the hull red which I'm going to use to put some some uh, rust spots on. So we don't need too much so we'll just pop a little bit onto the plate. Um, I'll get my water which I didn't have to hand, just a little bit of water and uh, what we'll do is we'll take that and very carefully apply that to the bands, being careful not to go over the edges. Because otherwise we'll have to come back with more of our wood colour. The idea is this is quite a stark contrast. And it is a stark contrast, so it's working how I wanted it to. So we'll get this painted silver. Okay, there we are. So that's that done. So now what we'll do is, it dries very quickly, it just takes no time. Just got a little bit of this, which is much more watery. And we'll water it down even more, like so. And just put it in places, just to make it look a little bit like it's got some discoloration. Just like that. Didn't even need what I put on the palette. It's the problem with these little droppers. I know everyone loves the droppers and hates the Games Workshop stuff, but if you only want a tiny amount, it's very, very difficult to only get a tiny amount. And you end up waste, which is what that is, pure waste. Anyway, there we are. We have the door. So what I'm now gonna do is move the camera around, get the glue out and stick it in place. All right, there we are. So that's where the door's gonna go. So what I've got is a little bit of the PVA glue, which I will paint on the bottom to wash this brush well. It's not what I normally use for glue. Hopefully I won't regret doing this. <laughs> and then it's gonna have a little bit at the top as well and just along that back, just so that wherever it touches, it's gonna be able to bind itself. It'll be a little bit delicate. You don't wanna be bashing it and treating it badly, but it should be okay as long as it doesn't get knocked too badly. That reminds me there's a little bit of repair work to be done over the back as well where the one of the one of the things the sprue uh, popped out away from the wall when I was dry brushing so I'll have to get that done as well I'll do that with the same thing just a little bit of glue and it'll go in so that now will go there and stick nicely hopefully there you are dries nice and clear so it's okay there we are the door is in place as has been established, my I was most nervous of doing the runes on the actual sarcophagus. So I had an idea, and I think it's going to work, and if it doesn't work, then I'll have to make a new sarcophagus. What it is, is I went onto the interwebs, and I've found a picture of the inscription that is on the tomb, on the actual sarcophagus. And I'm going to glue it on. And the reason I think this is actually going to work is because... The, um, it's supposed to be a little bit white, it will look a little bit more like it's actually a special stone rather than just being carved in, so it'll look a little bit fancier. And also, 
it will actually say what it's supposed to say rather than just some hard to read scroll, which is probably what I'd achieve. So what I'm doing is I'm very, very carefully cutting out around it using my safety ruler as a straight edge, easier than using scissors, easier to get a straight line and be a bit more accurate with your cuts. So we'll cut that out and then I'll stick it down simply using PVA. And hopefully it will work. <laughs> and if it doesn't, you'll see. So first of all, did I measure correctly? I measured it correctly. Look, that is a perfect size. You'll see that I've cut it so that it's got a little bit around the outside. So hopefully it will look like a, um, like a bit of stone that's been specially cut and carved to go onto Balin, son of Fundin, Lord of Moriah. Here lies. So we will very, very carefully pick that back up again. we can, there we are, and very, very, very carefully drop it in place and get it to line up and then weight it down because we don't want it to curl and as everyone knows, wet paper curls. So I'll weight that down with a weight. Be an amazing idea to use a weight to weight things down and I'll leave that to dry and hopefully that's done. So there you have it, the completed build. Printing out and sticking on the uh, um, Byland's tomb inscription worked really well apart from the fact that I was a little lump. <laughs> so it's not stuck down quite right, quite right. However, it looks much better than I would have got without uh, having done that. And all I need to do is put a little bit of varnish over the top to seal it down and it'll be absolutely fine. So I'll do that probably next. I don't have any matte varnish with me, so um, I need to find some, which is why I've not done it yet. But other than that, that's absolutely brilliant. I'm really, really pleased. Some One thing that I did suggest was to put a little bit of chain uh, over the end of the well. Now, I do have chain, but again, I couldn't find it, so I will uh, dig that out and probably add that on as well. But right now, I think it's absolutely fine, and I'm happy to wrap that up. I am really looking forward to playing a game on this. I'm just going to say that. And if I do, it will be being filmed. So keep an eye out on my channel. And if it's done by the time you're watching this, if you get to this late, then there will be a link to said video from here or towards the end or somewhere around now, which you can click on and go and have a look and see, because this is pretty much my favorite scenario. I love it. I love the March of the Ents as well. The Barland's Tomb, I've played it lots and I do love it. I'm really pleased with this. I'm very happy with how it's turned out. It's very playable. It's much better than my other attempt that I showed you, which is now in the process of being demolished and pieces recycled. I like the way that the uh, columns can be moved to make it a bit easier. I think they may need to be a little bit heavier, a little bit weightier, so I might put some air dry clay in the base uh, just to make them a little bit more solid so they aren't as easy to knock over. But apart from that, I think the way they described to make this is absolutely spot on and it's been a really fun and enjoyable process. It remains just for me to add Buddy the Cave Troll. Now Buddy the Cave Troll is the most misunderstood animal, creature, character in the whole of the videos, the whole of the films. All he wanted was to be left alone. And that look on his face when he gets done in by those nasty, nasty men just says it all. He's just confused. He doesn't know what's going on. And this is Buddy the Cave Troll. And finally, he has a Barlin's tomb that is worthy of him. I really love this model. I really do. One of the first ever things I bought was Barlin's tomb box set. And now I have a real Barlin's tomb to play the scenario on. So there you are, there's not much to add after that effusive, excited outro there, other than to say thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate the fact that you do put time in to watch my videos. I know they're not the shortest on YouTube, but I like to show everything. I don't like to trim and cut and spend lots and lots of time trying to uh, cut out my mistakes. 
I want you to see the whole process and I think well, that's what you get. So if you do enjoy this and you're not yet subscribed, don't forget to click that button and please tell your friends and get, let's, get these, uh, let's get other people seeing my videos. It would be wonderful to have more people watching these and enjoying my builds. I have such fun making them and I get such pleasure from seeing other people enjoy watching them as well. So, yep, yeah, thanks for watching and I will see you again next time and please stay healthy, stay safe and stay well.